to talk about this. So I will, I will hopefully um, uh, constrain myself to half an hour. Uh, and I'm going to talk about something that I have done called host info that's available on GitHub. And I have done it because I cannot not do it. Uh, it's interesting. It's one of these things where you go like, hmm, I wonder how this works. And then all of a sudden you go like, what? How is that possible? So anyhow, um, yeah. So to frame the, today's discussion, let's assume that you're going to buy a book, right? So you go to niftybook.org, you find your book, and you enter your credit card. Right. So am I secure doing this considering this? Uh, these numbered dots are, I mean, this is a fictitious example, but they are routers. So the way of the data is from, from me here, uh, number one, two, three, four, and so on. And it ends up in the United States, maybe together with my credit card. Or maybe it ends up here, <coughs> after passing through Egypt and Romania and stuff like that. Do you feel safe with your credit card on the loose there? So that is kind of what I'm, what I'm looking at here. First, let's give you an example of what it looks like. So this is a terminal thing. You run it in the terminal, and you get a number of interesting things. So this is the Swedish government, regeringen.se. And the geolocation says that it's in the United States, in California. How does that play with GDPR? Okay, so then we look at the ping time. 34 milliseconds, that is the time that the signal takes from my computer to the server and back. So you need to cut that in half. So do we actually get to California in 17 milliseconds? Good question. We will come back to that later. Uh, we can see... Uh, what domain names are covered by this certificate, uh, Rieng and government, Rieng's Kansliet and so on. And we can see that they're running a Windows platform, uh, Microsoft Information Servers thing. Just a teaser. So overview, we're going to talk about the geolocation, how far away the servers are, the way of the data, how, how does it travel. Time is money, but how much money? Uh, content delivery network. Uh, I'm going to try to explain that. Certificates, what makes the internet secure. And the uh, important part of the, of, of the process is called a secret handshake. Uh, but we need to go back a bit. When I was a kid, I was fascinated by maps. So in school, when we were supposed to have uh, sewing lessons, knitting and stuff, I wasn't really doing that together with my best friend. Under the table, we had these papers and we were drawing maps with roads and hills and valleys and whatnot. It was very funny. So maps has been an interest for me. Many years later, I did this. And this is open ports, also available on GitHub. It tells you what, um, your what other servers on the internet that your computer is talking to right now. So here we have a couple of interesting things. This is an authentic example from my computer uh, a couple of days ago. Right. So here we have the Google, uh, Google Docs sync, Google Drive, uh, and it communicates with the United States. Hmm. Here we have Box, and it goes to Germany, Frankfurt am Main. iCloud goes to Berlin in Germany. Uh, Dropbox, they used to be only United States. Now they are United States and Norway, apparently, and it's from a GDPR standpoint, it's equally bad. And then we have OneDrive, which goes to the United States and the Netherlands, and I don't really know what's, what goes where. One can dig further into that. But, so th that was my map interest a little bit more uh, refined, or how you want to put it. So servers, I mean, your computer talks to a lot of uh, stuff on the internet. When you surf to a web page, it needs to load in images, uh, CSS files, ads and whatnot from all over the world. This is an authentic example from last week on my computer. This is a firewall thing that I have called Little Snitch that shows me this. I have no idea what I'm talking to down in Africa, Ethiopia, I don't know, Saudi Arabia, uh, Russia. I don't know, I didn't surf to Russia, but apparently something has something going on. And it can be an, an, an SSH break-in attempt. So, well, you think you're only surfing at, at the computers at, at the university, or if you're at home, you're, you're looking for that book. 
your computer is doing a lot of stuff that you don't know about. So geolocation uh, is kind of interesting. That is locating devices, which these days uh, mostly are these guys, um, but also computers and everything. So you have ad networks that are very interested in serving you appropriate ads. So when you pass a store, they would like to, to show an ad for what that store has when you, as you pass it by. I'm constantly amazed by the number of single women interested in me uh, uh, who are located in Sela Sanbi, where I live. So they know that my computer is in Sela Sanbi. So how do they do that? And then you have security organizations or security organizations who are very interested in to know, knowing where you are. Uh, most operating systems contain uh, software, APIs, that you can use. And there are a number of services on the internet that you can use. Uh, hosting for use is something called ipinfo.io. Um, so can you trust what you get here? Well, kind of, but you shouldn't take it to the bank. If accuracy is important, uh, you should check it uh, from other sources. So then we get to how far away things are. So the ping thing I was talking about, these 17 milliseconds to the Swedish government. So here, this is a rough um, estimate of how far you get. So one milliseconds, that's usually universal things. You can, you can walk there or take your bicycle. 10 milliseconds, probably same country. So 17 milliseconds, well, in the vicinity. Same continent and uh, other side of the planet. So I constantly get in excess of 300 milliseconds when talking to China. And that is probably the Chinese firewall kicking. So how far do you get? And this is probably not the best lighting. Uh, so anyhow, uh, the, the signal goes from your computer to a server. It goes through Wi-Fi. That is the speed of light. It goes through copper cable, maybe. Uh, two thirds of the speed of light and fiber cables around 70% of the speed of light, which in 10 milliseconds will get you 3,000 kilometers, almost 2,000 and slightly above 2,000. So you can know that New York is approximately 30 milliseconds away if everything is fiber cable only. And it's not. Uh, there are more things. Um, I have tried to get some estimate of the time spent in routers because I'm going to show you an authentic example in a bit. The signal goes from your computer through a bunch of routers, and that can be like maybe five or 30. And they consume time. They can either just pass through the signal or they can do something called traffic shaping. If you're, for instance, doing a Skype call, video and primarily audio is very important. So that is prioritized over something, say you, you do download something, which is not time critical. So that doesn't need to be traffic shaped. Uh, so, the way of the data, so it's your computer, some kind of network, and a server, and then back and forth all the time. And actually it's a little more complex, there are more stuff in between, you have a Wi-Fi router and you have a number of routers, so every time you do something, it goes pop, 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 pop to the server and pop, 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 back, every time. And the data is chopped up in chunks, approximately half a page full of text called packets. So uh, a, a large transfer can be several packets, which of course need to be uh, sent in order and re uh, arrive in order and everything. And all of these things go back and forth. So let's look at an authentic example. Oops, sorry, that was too quick. This is from my machine to a university in New Zealand, other side of the planet. So here I, uh, we see that there are 24 routers in between. So every time I surf to that web server, it needs to go through 24 s routers and back. Every single packet, back and forth. So the, these first are in Sweden, then it crosses the Atlantic and we are in the United States. I looked up, it's actually there and you can see that this is probably where we get across the United States through a long cable and here we are in New Zealand. Uh, this is a pretty cool utility called MTR. Um, so, uh, so there is a, a lot of things happening from your machine to the server. And time is money. So in 2009, Amazon found that 0.1 second of delay cost them 1% in sales. 
Uh, Google found uh, approx approximately the same half a second in page generation, dropped their traffic by a fifth, right? That was then. Ten years later, the figure was not 1% for Amazon, but 7%. And imagine what Amazon, uh, I mean, their turnover rate, how much they sell every hour. And a reduced uh, uh, sale of 7%. That's big money. That means that they can use that money for this, content delivery network. Uh, maybe you have heard of caches, that you have a web cache on your computer and the, uh, the web server may have a cache. That is to store frequently uh, requested stuff in, in a faster fashion. CDNs take that to a whole new level. Um, commercial uh, corporations, a crap load of them, Akamai was the first well-known. Uh, they deliver data uh, and video and applications to customers with a low latency. They can also absorb an, a network attack uh, so that the service keep functioning. Uh, so they have a point of presence around the planet, data centers, physical data centers around the planet where they, they serve stuff from. And they collaborate with DNS servers to fool your computer. So when I'm sitting here in Lund, and, and I'm surfing to um, the Macworld in San Francisco. I'm not surfing to Macworld in San Francisco. I'm surfing to a point of presence in Stockholm, which is much faster, which means Macworld pays money to somebody to serve it faster, to make me more happy, because time, as we saw in the previous slide, time is money. So CDN is big business today, and it makes it hard to determine where things actually are. So I looked at the, all the big universities in, in the United States out of curiosity, and they all use CDNs, which means that they all pay for CDNs. Uh, so Yale, for instance, appears to be located in England, Great Britain, not on the American East Coast. So anyhow, certificates. This is where we get to, to maybe the interesting stuff. So people have been, scientists have been looking at certificates. Uh, this, is, this is way too small. Anyhow. Uh, how do they work? So scientists have been looking at this for quite some time and they concluded that it's either how Slytherin of Hogwarts or Mordor behind that. No, seriously. Uh, a digital certificate officially states that something is true, like a physical certificate. Um, they are used for websites, email, VPN uh, and software. We recently have started to, to sign, digitally sign software here at the department because we need to, otherwise it won't run on, com on computers. They have a certain validity period and they can be revoked on a command from, from, from a central authority. It doesn't physically take away the certificate, but it says that this is no longer to be trusted. Uh, for websites and email, they are used for encryption and identification to make sure that nobody can understand what they hear if they listen to the traffic and to make sure that, that the server is actually the thing it says it is. Uh, a certificate, certificate, certificate that was hard, consists of a key pair, a private key and a public key. They are mathematically uh, linked but different. Private key um, is created when you, when you create, in the process of creating a certificate, you get a private key, and then that never leaves its birthplace. The private key is super important. Um, for instance, we have a number of, of web services at, at our department, and we keep the, the private key on that machine, but in a separate directory with, with very hard restrictions on. Um, the public key, on the other hand, must be distributed. And one thing that, uh, also too small to read, <laughs> if you had this same setup with your car, you could lock your car with a public key and leave the key in the lock because you can lock it, but you can't unlock it. F for the unlocking, you need the private key. So how does this work? You have a certificate. How do you know it's true? Well, they exist in chains, a root certificate that is made by a certif certificate authority, something in between and the end entity certificate. 
such as this. This is our Moodle server at the department, which is um, issued by DigiCert. And we have something in between so that we don't, when, when, when I create a certificate, I don't need to talk to them, but I talk to, to the intermediary. Uh, and this is uh, uh, an expanded view, so we should probably expand that a bit. You have the root certificate, which is, has signed itself, and that is a separate process that we won't go into. Uh, um, then that is used to sign the intermediate, and that is used to sign the end entity. And the end entity refers to the intermediate, which refers to the root certificate. So the root certificate, so this is a chain that can be checked. If, if all, all the numbers are correct, then we can trust the chain, and we implicitly trust the root certificate. I'll get, uh, come to that. So you can view it as a tree where the server provides this chain and the client verifies the same chain. So how do they do that? How are these implicitly trusted? Well, your computer and your web browser comes preloaded with a bunch of root certificates. And I can also say that root certificate authorities can be and has been revoked no longer trusted. So all of a sudden, a certain root certificate is no longer trusted. Um, so the operating system and or the web browser, uh, and I don't know how often they do this, they check for updates to this list, both uh, additions and subtractions. Uh, so that is, that is kind of how it, how it works, so that your computer, when you surf to Amazon or something, you don't physically have to go to Amazon and get their root certificate because you already have it in your computer. So how do you see them? Well, uh, you click on the padlock. It's located in different places. And then you can click Show Certificate, and you get this chain that I showed in the previous picture. So, now we get to the secret handshake. <laughs> uh, so this is an interesting process. How do we get from a situation where A and B is talking in the open, and C is there listening? And then we get to a situation where A and B is still talking, and C hears everything but cannot understand anything, but heard everything that was passed in between them. So how does that work? That is the secret handshake. Um, so one can say that this is done by the TLS, transport layer security thing, uh, and it uses an asymmetric uh, encryption for the handshake phase, and then during the actual transfer, when you're running on Amazon with the padlock, you're using symmetric encryption, which is much, much faster. Uh, back in the day, you had SSL. Uh, maybe you remember that. That's uh, the only reason I have this slide. SSL 2, 3, which was replaced by TLS 1, 1, 0, 1, 1, 1, 2, and 1, 3 is about to come now. And one of the things with 1, 3 is they cut all the ties with previous, with legacy. Uh, and re they reduce the number of steps that goes between the server and the client in the handshake process to make the timing quicker, to make Amazon more happy, because it doesn't take so long to, to establish a secure connection. So hopefully uh, TLS 1.3 will be here, I mean, in, in in a browser near you in the, in the short term. So how does it work? Well, first the clients <laughs> send a hello message to the server, uh, assess what kind of cryptos it, it can handle, and also send a bunch of random data that will be used later. The server responds, hello to you, sends its public certificate, cipher suit, and a server random bit of data. The client verifies the server certificate with the chain we saw before. And then it sends a pre-master secret, another bunch of uh, random data that is encrypted with a public key. And this is the important thing, because in the next step, the server decrypts the pre-master secret using the private key. And that is the thing that is never transferred between A and B, that enables the secure communication, which locks out the party C from the whole thing. Session keys are generated and they exchange some finished messages and then they go from asymmetric encryption to symmetric encryption and we are up and running. So, enough theory, uh, time for some examples. Lund University, um, well, 
two registered DNSs. And this was interesting when I first saw it. It has an asterisk here, if you can see, asterisk.lu.se and lu.se. This asterisk is not present in LTH web server. We can also see that it's running Drupal, which we knew. So here we have LTH. Well, there is a no asterisk in the LTH certificate. And as of today, I don't really know. Uh, uh, the Perfurebe has been promising that they should have a certificate that should work before the end of February that passed a couple of days ago. So I don't really know what's going on there. Um, here we have the Swedish government. Uh, and well, United States, but we can also say that it is served by the CDN Incapsula, which is one of the commercial corporations. And the ping time isn't awesome. I would expect, I don't know where Incapsula have their points of presence, probably in the vicinity, but one of the reasons is that the Swedish government haven't paid so much for actual speed, but instead paid more for resilience against network attack. Maybe this is speculation on my part. So that's the, the ping time. And we have, like we said, the, these before. So Swedish armed forces, are they in the United States? Well, no, they are in Shista. Oh, thank God. Uh, and they cover a bunch of, of uh, various domain names that make sense, all of them. You have Dagens Nyheter in the Swedish newspaper. Um, Cambridge, United States, nah, it's served by Akamai. So it's probably not in the United States. Uh, ping time 1.7 milliseconds, that is close. They pay for this. They want you to be happy. And you have a bunch of, and this is kind of interesting, a bunch of, of domain names that are covered that kind of make you, well, okay, this is part, probably part of the Bonnier uh, Corporation. Uh, Expressen, Dagen Nyheter, um, hmm, Nordic Tech List, Dagens Industri, well, Sydsvenskan apparently. Uh, this is kind of interesting. This is one, one of the political parties, and I did this in, in July last year. Um, <clears throat> United States, no, Cloudflare. Uh, so it's, it's too fast to be the United States. But here we have a crapload of domain names covered by the same certificate. And the downside, of course, is that if, if, if get, get you, whatever that is, if that should be broken or something, they revoke the certificate that makes all of these, boom, go away. None of these domains are trusted. So that's not really good. So I did this uh, again. It was the same with, with other political parties. This was just an example. Uh, the other day, the other day, is just Moratona and Cloudflare, which is kind of interesting. Another interesting example, Hoar Webben at the university. <laughs> 219 registered domain names on the same certificate. Woo. Um, funny thing is when I did that this, the day after, it was only two. And I think the reason is that they have, they have some sort of load balancing and I happened to get another pipe the day after that happened to serve another certificate, which makes me wonder if things are really proper. Um, then we have an expired certificate. This is from our own backup server. It doesn't really matter, but, but I clarify that it has expired in, in the output from the script. So, uh, nerd corner, what, what do I do here? Curl, open SSL, that is the bulk of the script. Dig, ping, and of course, awk and said. No script is complete without awk and said. And you can relax, there is no port scanning. You can run this thing without being um, uh, uh, band or anything like that. So that is